Hello, my name is Zachary Lewis, and this is the first episode in uh, the Game Studios series uh, of video tutorials about learning Flash Punk, uh, getting into it, making your own game. So in this tutorial, I'm going to show you where to get Flash Punk, what to download to get all set up for it, how to set up your environment, and then creating a little game where you can move a square around the screen. So the first thing you, you need to do is go to the Flash Punk website at flashpunk.net then you want to go to download and here you can download the current version of Flashpunk so go ahead and grab that I've already downloaded it for time's sake and then if you go to tutorials and then setting up flash develop if you follow the first couple steps here this will show you all the files that you need to get and I already have those files downloaded so I'm going to begin there once I have downloaded flash develop and the flex SDK and have installed them So when you first boot up Flash Develop, you'll see a screen like this. Now there's two key things that you've got to set up before you can start writing any code. First go to Tools, Program Settings, then AS3 Context, where it says Flex SDK Location. You'll want to point that to your Flex SDK. I've unzipped mine to the Flex SDK folder. So you'll just want to navigate there and find your root folder for your SDK that you downloaded. Second, you'll want to scroll down to Flash Viewer and in the tutorial steps it'll tell you to download this debug player and I've just put that into the flex SDK folder for ease of access and so all you want to do there is again point flash develop to it so the first thing we need to do is create a brand new project so over in this project area you can click create new project now we're just going to make a simple action script 3 project you want to browse for where you want to save it I like to, to create a folder in my documents for all my flash develop files and I've created one for the video tutorials so I'll just hit OK and I will name it first game I want to create a, a directory for me and check down here just to make sure that this is where we want to save it and we'll hit OK name it Now that will set your author name for Flash Develop. So as you can see, when I load up the main, which it gives me, my name's already in there. So the first thing we want to do, now that we've created our brand new project, is we want to open up that folder and put all of the Flash Punk assets into it. So as you can see, I've already extracted Flash Punk into the Flash Punk library. And you'll see a couple files here. All we really want is the net file. Right, this contains all of the Flash Punk data that you can see. So, just copy that into our first game that we just made and into the source folder. We'll go ahead and paste it there. We can minimize that, and as you can see, we now have the Flash Punk in our Flash Develop. So, the first thing we're going to want to do is do a little bit of cleanup on the main function. Now main is the, is the entry point for your program and the way that Flashpunk works is it extends something called engine so we can go ahead and get rid of these import statements I'll make this a little bit bigger for you guys to see at home so main extends engine and you can see how flash develop automatically intellitypes that for us so it'll automatically import engine now we don't need this yet and we don't need this. So what we're going to do is we're going to call our constructor, which in this case is going to be super, which is for our, our engine. Now it's asking for the width and height of our game. So we'll set it to something small, like 240 by 320. Now let's go the other way. 320, yes, by 240. And then I like to leave all the rest at the default, running at 60 frames a second uh, with a variable time step. So once you've got that done, you should be able to run the program. Just hit this blue arrow. It'll compile, and then not very impressive. Uh, it's 
kind of popping out of the screen here. And so we have a little bit more, more work to do. But at, at, at least we can see something going on. I'm going to go ahead and close this files tab because that's just in our way. I'm going to close everything down to my project. So as you can see, we're creating a window that's 320 by 240. So I'll right click on the first game, up at the name of our project, and we'll go to properties. You can also reach this menu, this menu by going to project properties. So we want to make sure that we're targeting flash player 10 or higher. And here are our initial dimensions. So we should probably match this 320 by 240. Now you can see that when we run it, it'll be the proper size. Now, a lot of games use a pixely look, uh, and they achieve that by doubling the size of the screen. So we'll go back into here and set this for 640 by 480. See how that worked out? I'm a genius. And we'll go ahead, and now we're going to use the FP class. So we need to import that. And FP is basically a Flash Punk helper class, which has a lot of common functionality into it. So you're pretty much going to want to use FP in almost all of your classes. So, but the property we want now is FP.screen.scale. And so we'll set that equal to 2. So basically what that's going to do is double each pixel to give it that, that obviously blocky look. And you can see that we're easily filling out our screen now. So now we're, we're really getting somewhere. Now after the engine is initialized, it calls a function called init. So we want to gain access to that by overriding it. So we can use override init, and it'll know what I'm trying to do. And so all you want to do here, we'll put out a little trace statement. And we'll say, Flashpunk has initialized. So now this is just going to output to our output window that Flashpunk has initialized. So we're going to go ahead and run that. And as you can see, it shows our window and it says right here, Flashpunk is in fact initialized, which is great. That means that our Flash player is talking back to our Flash develop. So that means that you've set up all your properties right and we're ready to move on. So the first big thing about how Flashpunk works is it's based around worlds. So you'll have different worlds for each aspect of your game. So for your title screen, you'll probably have a title world, which handles all of the functionality for your title screen. Then if you have a level select menu, then you can have a level world, which handles you know how your character moves around the world map. Then finally, you can have an in-game world, you know where all of the actual game action happens. And it's easy to save these states and switch between worlds e effortlessly. Um, so it's a pretty clever design and can allow for some really robust features. Uh, but for right now, we're just going to make a really simple world. So in order to create that new class, we're going to right click on our source, add new class. We're going to go ahead and name this game world. because That's the world where our game is actually going to be taking place. And I like to browse here what we're going to extend. And net.flashpunk.world. Now you can manually do this, but I just find that it's easier just to do it right here. All right, so now we have our brand new world. So what do we do with this world? Well, uh, in the constructor, right? let's go ahead and give a trace statement, just so we know that the world is in fact there. So game world constructor. Right. Now, nothing's going to happen right now because this game world isn't told anything about the other game. So we're going to go in here, and after this we're going to say fp.world equals a brand new game world. Now, when we run it, you'll see Flashpunk has initialized and a game world constructor has been called. So this is great. This is showing us that our game world is now active. So back into game world, now we can actually start digging into some Flashpunk functionality. So I'm not going to import any graphic assets for this, but I will create a simple square. So the first thing we need is a private variable. And it'll be our square. 
and it'll be an entity. And an entity is the base class that almost every game object starts off from in FlashPump. So the first thing we'll do is we're going to override the begin function for, for the world. This says that this world has been loaded and it started. Now we're going to want to create a brand new in square in entity, but first it probably needs a graphic. As you can see, the properties here, it needs an X location, a Y location, and a graphic. So the first thing we'll do is create a local variable here, and we'll use image. Now since I'm not importing any assets, I'm just going to write a raw bit bitmap data. Now next tutorial I'll show you how to actually bring in your own. So let's make it a 16 by 16 square. Um, that's just pure white. That's all you need for that. Now, uh, square e equals a new entity. And we'll just center it at zero, zero, and our graphic will be image. Now, to see this square, we need to add it to our world. So we'll just say add square. And we'll run it. Now you can see we have a white square right up in, in, in the top corner. So now we're going to have our square move around where our mouse cursor is. In order to do this, we're going to override our update function. Now this means every time the world ticks, this function will, will get called. So it'll be called many times each, each second. Uh, when you start getting into more complex systems, you'll want to uh, have update functions for each of your entities or types of, of entities, right? So your enemy will handle its own updating and your player will handle its own updating. But for this simple example, we can put it all into the world. So in the update function, we'll want to use the input class. So we need to make sure that we import input. That's there we go. So now, each frame, what we'll do is we'll set the square's x and y location to our mouse position. So square.x equals input dot mouse x and square.y equals input dot mouse y. We'll go ahead and run that as well. So now you can see that our square is following our mouse cursor. So each frame, our square is getting set to the, to, the, to the location of the mouse. So this isn't really fun yet, but you can see that we now have a dynamic object moving uh, around in, in our world. And it's only been 13 minutes since you just installed this thing. So that's, that's pretty cool. Now let's add some even more improved fun uh, functionality. We'll have it where whenever you click, then the square will become a different random color. So now, if input dot mouse pressed, now this is a function that will check to see if the mouse was pressed. We'll go ahead and trace, just to make sure that this works. We'll trace it out. And that is incorrect. So we will. Okay. It's not a function. So now you see that each time we click, it'll say mouse press down here. So now what I'm going to do is typecast the image square.graphic. So this is getting a handle to, to the square's graphic dot color equals fp dot random. And again, we'll have to import FP. And we want it to be a random between the maximum color. So now we move, we click each time, it's a brand new color. So there you have it. From installing Flashpoint to a very, very simple game in under 15 minutes. Stay tuned for episode two.